Welcome to Social Distance Assistance. I'm Kelly. And I'm June. Our show today is about the environment. It was my idea, by the way. We'll tell you about how staying safe from the coronavirus means there's also more trash to pick up. We'll also tell you about a woman who rescues and rehabilitates orphaned and injured bats and how she's helping keep North American bats safe from humans that have COVID-19. P.S. Bats are my favorite, so are sloths and cats and dogs and hamsters and... And we'll also talk about environmental justice and environmental racism in the United States and how they're linked to COVID-19. Sharks and octopus and platypus and kangaroos and ocelots and sand cats and wolves. Phone calls with friends are helping us get through this moment. On a new podcast called Social Distance from the Atlantic, two friends talk every day about living through this weird time. But one of those friends is a doctor, James Hamblin. He answers questions like, how should I wear a mask? How do I deal with grief? When will this be over? Subscribe to Social Distance to get solid information from friendly voices. Since the coronavirus pandemic started, we've heard about skies clearing up, pollution levels going down, fewer emissions from cars and planes. Animals have been spotted wandering down empty city streets, just peeking in the windows. Nature has been doing its thing with so many people staying at home. But humans still manage to leave their mark. A couple of weeks before the lockdown in Miami Beach, um, I usually go for a walk through the causeway. It's a beautiful view. And I spotted about 18 gloves just, you know, on my regular walk. And I couldn't believe my eyes. And that's when I realized that we were going to have a really big issue because COVID was bringing more than just sickness and economical issues and death. You know, it's also bringing a huge environmental crisis. Maria Algara is a bartender and paralegal turned environmentalist in Miami Beach, Florida. On Earth Day last year, she started this group called Clean This Beach Up. Great name, by the way. At Clean This Beach Up, we do weekly cleanups. It could be once or twice a week. We would always have anywhere between 50 volunteers to 100 volunteers during one event. So at the very beginning of the pandemic, what we were seeing the most were gloves. It was gloves here and there on the water, unfortunately. A couple of weeks after, we started seeing the masks. We are finding so many masks everywhere, parking lots, the floor, even in the bay and the ocean. That and the Clorox wipes, baby wipes, we find them everywhere. And we know this because we spend three, four times a, a week, you know, paddle boarding or doing water sports. And we see that at first hand right in front of our faces, floating next to a manatee or a dolphin. So it's really heartbreaking. It's been very difficult dealing with COVID because we are not allowed to have large gatherings and to go out to the beach and clean as we used to. We clean up once a week with as many volunteers as we can right now. Uh, we're doing small cleanups of 10, maybe 15 people at a time with social distancing. I believe we're going through very, very tough and important times, you know, where we have to take action. We have to start waking up and realizing that we don't have much time to fix the issues that we're going through. You know, climate change, global warming. These are things that affect people all around the world. I feel that 2020, it's a wake up call for everyone to say, hey, guys, I am Mother Earth and you have to do better because we are running out of time. Not all plastic is recyclable especially things like nitrile and latex gloves. This, these items are not biodegradable. And so a lot of environmentalists uh, started picking them up. We try to walk the walk, you know. That's why we started pushing the glove challenge. 
The glove challenge started as an online campaign. The idea was to count how many gloves were being littered around Miami-Dade County and South Florida in general. It started with that, just take a picture, snap a shot, and tag us. And so we have picked up already over 1,100 gloves just from our neighborhood. And it was just shocking to see that it was mostly residents of Miami Beach. I put uh, everyone on blast during one of uh, our TV interviews because they said, what do, you, what do you think about this? Where is this trash coming from? I said, well, you know, there are no tourists to blame right now. So this is all done by people who live in Miami Beach, by residents, by neighbors, you know, friends. And, and it's unfair that we're treating our own streets like this. Right now, we are during turtle nesting season. And so it's, it's very sad that gloves are swarming our beaches more than plastic bags right now. And these are items that turtles and other marine life see as food. It's really worrying. One out of a thousand baby turtles makes it to adulthood. So imagine these little babies leaving the eggs and going right into, I don't know, a, a swarm of gloves or microplastics. They won't make it. We have a lot of people that always text me and they say, I, I know you don't know me. I went to your beach cleanup and you changed my mind completely because you are, first, you're a girl. Second, you're a minority. Third, you did this all by yourself. You inspire me to be better and to go out there and try to do as much as I can and help the community. I, I believe that you don't have to be near a beach or a lake or a waterway in order to do a cleanup. Streets cleanup are the most important of all because all the trash from the street makes it into our waterways. And so we encourage everyone out there to go for a walk and just picture and see how many pieces of plastic you can spot during your walk. And so the day after, you're going to grab a pair of gloves and a bag and you're going to pick them up. As long as we protect ourselves, we wear masks, gloves and maybe a picker and a grabber, that's all you really need. And you're going to feel way better because you're exercising and you're doing something good for Mother Earth. You can help Maria by picking up trash where you live. And if you need advice on where to get one of those grabby things to pick up trash, or the best way to organize a pickup in your area, you can reach her on Instagram at cleanthisbeachup. The group is working on expanding to other cities later this year or in 2021. The dominant story for the past few months has been that COVID-19 is a virus transmitted to humans from animals, animals like East Asian bats. But the truth is that we don't actually know if COVID came from bats or pangolins or civet cats or what. We do know that similar viruses have been found in non-human species, and we know that humans have made the global environment more hospitable for viruses like COVID-19 to develop in those animals, by clear-cutting rainforests or through rapid urbanization and factory farming. In other words, even if humans did get COVID from bats, we were the ones who have been creating the conditions for bats to transmit it to us in the first place. So, Mom, are you ready for a bat fact? Totally. Lay it on me. Okay. Out of all the living mammals right now, one in five of them is a bat. That is nuts. But it's true. There are over 1,400 species of bats, and they live all over the world, except for Antarctica and the very, very far northern polar places. They eat bugs like mosquitoes, some pollinate plants, and others eat fruit, which spreads seeds. In North America, they're out every night, except in winter, when they're hibernating. Right now, bats in North America do not have COVID-19. But they are being plagued by a fungus called white nose syndrome. It affects hibernating bats and has already killed a million of them across 10 states and in Canada since 2006. 
if we don't find a way to slow it down, some scientists think it could make the little brown bat extinct in the Northeast in about 16 years. Since bats are an essential part of almost every ecosystem, it's important that we take care of them. Normally this time of year, I would be feeding little tiny baby bats about every three to four hours all day long, all night long. This is Leslie Sturgis. She's the president of a nonprofit that does rescue and rehabilitation of orphaned and injured bats. They also do a lot of public education around conservation, bats, and the environment. So a baby bat around here can be born at about one gram in weight, up to about three grams, and then they grow as fast as songbirds do. So they need to eat a lot and they need to eat often and it's very exhausting. But when it's not baby season, we usually spend time, you know, taking bats to the vet and, and doing treatments and preparing food and washing dishes and doing an awful lot of laundry. It's like having a regular baby. Yes, very much. Only in most years, um, I have up to two dozen of them. Oh, God. <laughs> wow. <laughs> And usually I'm very sleep deprived this time of year, but because of restrictions this year, I'm actually not. It's weird. I've been doing this for 20 years and this is the first summer that I am getting normal amounts of sleep and I don't quite know what to do with myself. The restrictions Leslie is talking about are federal restrictions about who is allowed to be around bats right now. The restrictions are in place so that North American bats stay protected from humans humans that might give the bats COVID-19, which might sound a little backwards. How has your job helping bats changed because of COVID? Oh my, it's kind of sad for me right now because when people first started looking at SARS types of viruses, which is what COVID is, there was an interest in bats because of this virus that they found in China. And I was actually involved with, in a study where they used lung tissue from a North American bat to see if these SARS viruses could replicate. And they did. So everyone's kind of been a little worried about our bats if one of these pandemics came this way. And if, here we are. And just to be clear, people are worried that humans are going to give the virus to the bats in North America? That's the concern? Yeah, let me just clarify that. North American bats do not have and do not transmit COVID to anyone anywhere. We don't want it getting into their populations because we don't want them to turn out to be susceptible to it and die in droves, which is what happened with white nose syndrome. The consensus was pretty much that we should stop rehabilitating bats and stop researching bats where there was direct contact with wild bats and to stop allowing cavers into caves where there were bat populations. So it really just shut down what I do. Now, I was allowed to keep the bats that I had already had in, in rehabilitation. And right now they are out in an outdoor flight cage so they can get the proper amount of exercise, and they are eating me out of house and home because they're not out in the wild eating bugs. I have to feed them. So there's that. But, you know, being kept in captivity for a long time isn't great for them either. So they're sitting around being bored with nothing to do. So there's some ramifications, some, some you know, effects that this is having on not just me and my ability to do what I love doing, but on the bats themselves. So we don't want the bats to get COVID because we don't want a valuable part of our ecosystem to die. But also, we don't want bats to get COVID and then COVID to mutate while it's in the bats and then jump back into humans as a new disease. I think that's a much less risk there, but the it getting two bats and having them susceptible to it is not an insignificant risk. 
What role do humans play in setting up bats to get diseases like COVID in the first place? Ah, well, well, I just want to make one thing a little bit clearer is that there is no direct link currently between people, COVID, and bats. COVID is very similar to a virus that was found in bats in China. So we're not entirely sure that this may have come from that bat with that virus, but there may have been an intermediate species that the virus jumped to and then to humans. So it's not like it was, you know, somebody eating a bat. I mean, it doesn't work like that. So in general, when we think about the environmental factors that lead to something like that happening, these viral jumps, it it seems to be where you get interactions between wildlife and farm animals. So when people go, say, and clear a rainforest and start pig farming, we've had a viral jumps happen there. Um, the wild markets, those sorts of situations where all the animals are under stress and they're really crowded and it's unsanitary, viruses start jumping around from species to species and become pretty nasty. I think it's much more about you know, how do we sustain our populations without impacting wild populations? So it comes down to governments and and societies and how do we want to interact with our world and, and share it with the other things that live here too. What do you like about bats? What's not to like about bats? They're amazing. They're nocturnal. They fly. They do everything faster than you can imagine. They're really, really smart. They have really tight social bonds for our colonial bats. They have huge, almost societies. Like if you think about Bracken Cave in Texas, there's millions and millions and millions of bats that live in there. And they have millions of babies. And they can find their own pup in this huge crowd of pups. So they are really social and really keyed into each other. And I think that's fascinating. I mean, vampire bats, everybody's favorite bat, is this amazing creature that actually shows altruism, which is doing something for someone else for nothing in return. And they've shown that vampire bats do that with sharing blood meals. So I mean, bats are just fascinating. Will your job as a bat advocate be tougher going forward after COVID? What will you do to help people love and respect bats? Well, I'm hopeful that the groundwork we've already done will hold. I think a lot of people are very sympathetic to bats. They're going to understand that this is not anything that bats did. I think where we're really going to have to do a lot more work is probably in places where people aren't well educated on the environmental issues that, you know, everybody faces everywhere. And so I think there will always be plenty of work for a bat advocate. I think it's never ending because if it's not COVID, it's rabies. And if it's not rabies, it's, you know, fears of that bat poop is toxic. I hear that all the time. People have crazy ideas about what kind of a threat bats represent. So I, I think there's plenty to do and to keep doing. How can we help you right now? Thank, well, thank you for wanting to, number one. In the last week or so, I've gotten a lot of phone calls about finding a baby bat on the ground. We've actually made a guide for how to reunite bat pups. It's on our website. It's savelucythebat.org. It's, you know, just some some ways you can try and get the baby to a place where the mother can come get it if she's still around. And people are trying that as much as possible. Leave bats alone right now. If they're, you know, in your attic to fix your house so the bats can't get into your living quarters. And then when the bats leave in the fall to go hibernate, fix your house so they can't get back in. But don't kick them out right now because they have their babies with them. 
if people find bats down on the ground, bring the kids and the cats and the dogs inside and let that animal recover and get away on its own. Don't try to hug and kiss and squeeze them, which, you know, you'd be surprised. There are people out there who love nature to that point. Uh, yep. <laughs> I'm standing next to her right now. Ah, uh, yeah. So, I mean, when you find something cute and fluffy or, you know, big blinky eyes and it's a wild animal, it's still a wild animal. So we want to make sure we give them the space and the respect that they need to live their wild lives. We've been talking about work and jobs and stuff, and I did want to just make sure everybody knew that we are actually an all-volunteer organization. And most advocacy groups like us, grassroots, local-based advocacy groups are our volunteer. Um, there's always a need for volunteers. And in this time of social distancing, there are still volunteer opportunities that can be done from home or um you know, or just helping out with the advocacy wherever you happen to be is wonderful and appreciated. To learn more about Leslie's work and to volunteer to support bat rehab, visit SaveLucyTheBat.org. And to learn more about how we're not just passive victims to diseases spread by animals, there's a really interesting article by Seagal Samuel in Vox called how our environmental practices make pandemics like the coronavirus more likely. Check it out. We'd like to tell you about a new podcast called Kids These Days. It's hosted by teens, and it's about teens. The show offers an unfiltered look at teenage life, what they're thinking about, laughing about, and stressing about, Everything from first kisses, to vaping, to living with school lockdowns, climate change, and the coronavirus. Kids These Days, a new limited-run podcast from Community High School in Ann Arbor and Michigan Radio's Peabody Award-winning team. Subscribe now at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. The coronavirus has had a disproportionate impact on Black and Brown communities. Black people have a higher risk of getting the virus and are much more likely to die from it. Tina Johnston calls this pandemic another Katrina moment. Seeing again that during a crisis, the folks that are left holding the bag, receiving the greatest amount of damage, and who have done the least amount to deserve it, are Black people. And seeing Katrina and seeing that, you know, yes, it, there was this hurricane, the levees broke and the folks that were devastated and were never able to fully recover were Black people. The folks begging for help were Black people. Tina works on environmental and climate justice policy and is the new director of the National Black Environmental Justice Network, which relaunched a few weeks ago in response to the pandemic. We'll tell you about that group in a minute. But first, we want to talk about the concept of environmental justice. Justice is not a new idea to me. I've been out to lots of protests with my parents, and we have regular talks about social justice in my house, but environmental justice wasn't something I'd really heard of. Environmental justice takes in all of what we understand as environment. Where you live, where you work, where you play, where you worship. It's the natural environment in which you breathe fresh air or take a hike in the, the forest. And it's focused on having those spaces, our homes, our communities, to have fair, just, and equitable access to having a quality of life that is the same across the board, that we all have the same high quality of life. Is environmental justice a new thing? Actually, it isn't a new thing. Over 30 years ago, there was a woman, actually, who coined the, the term environmental racism. And from that, that phrase of environmental racism, where we discuss the fact that based on our race or our ethnicity or the fact that we're African-American, we are being polluted more than white Americans are being polluted on. There's a place in Louisiana that's called Cancer Alley, where you can see this community surrounded by um, heavy 
pollutant businesses or factory pro- producers of pollution, in particular chemical toxins. And uh, they could go outside and they could see a layer of film on their cars that was being dropped from the air from these polluting plants. And when they look at, looked at where these polluting plants were situated across the regions in the U.S., they were predominantly placed in African-American communities. African-Americans who make fifty to $60,000 a year are more likely to live in a polluting, polluted community than a white American who makes $10,000 a year. That you will be polluted on simply because of the color of your skin, because you can't buy that house in the community you want to go into. Um, so it's been around for a while. It's actually been around a lot longer than climate justice. <laughs> How is the coronavirus an environmental justice issue like air and water pollution? I mean, globally, we see that this pandemic has um, impacted every corner of the world. And yet in the U.S., what we see is that COVID has had this extremely devastating impact on the African-American community because of bad air quality, bad water quality, because of the pollution that already existed in these communities because they were already in communities that were compromised um, by industries that pollute and were allowed to pollute. And so what I would say, and what we call this is the politics of pollution, and what it translates into is more illnesses, suffering, and death, and that COVID-19 exasperates or increases what it is that we see already with these other bad actors, such as bad air quality and water. And so we're seeing that COVID-19 is attacking vulnerabilities that already existed in communities that a pandemic like this could actually take advantage of. Those pollutants that are in their bodies, that particulate matter in their body, is now COVID can hitch a ride onto that, and then it goes in and wreaks havoc. So you have folks who are, they have because there's food deserts or food insecurity, these folks um, potentially have um, suffer from obesity or they have high blood pressure or heart disease. So all of these things are that exist before COVID are now only a feeding. It's a feeding ground for COVID. Before the pandemic, we found it really difficult to get people to learn about and care deeply about climate change, even though kind of like COVID. It's something that would have affected the entire planet, like by definition, right? So why do you think people didn't take climate change as seriously as they did the coronavirus? What about COVID is more threatening or scarier than, you know, the death of the planet? Part of my work has been at the United Nations Framework on Climate Change. So this is a question I used to say to my my colleagues the, the way that we're going to get everyone on the same page to care about this is if we all have the same exact experience, climate experience, at the same exact time for us to all understand its impact, then we will all understand globally what needs to be done. Because you have an earthquake here, a tsunami there, you have all these independent crises. And so it's really difficult for folks to understand the connective tissue that brings them all together. And I think with COVID, it's a global pandemic. And so I think it's that shared fear, the shared knowledge that someone that we care for could be, might get sick and die. The heightened awareness of COVID and its danger, we can see it, right? The hospital beds are full. I had a friend who passed away from COVID. You can't travel. There's no flights. I mean, it's felt. And climate change, even though it's felt, it's felt differently. It doesn't necessarily impact everyone's livelihood the way COVID has. So I think it's difficult to compare COVID to climate change because they have really different implications for people's lives on a daily basis. How can people support environmental justice projects while staying away from COVID? 
One way is to support your local environmental justice community organizations or to engage with them on how to learn more about environmental justice if it's something that's new to you, to figure out ways to help prop up the, the work that they're doing, and to learn about equity, justice, and fairness. It's good to want to, to assist or to engage, but also understand the issue and how to become part of the solution and talk through what that solution looks like through an equity lens. If you can donate to your um, to those groups, please do so because they need it. I mean, many of them are working on shoestring budgets and they're doing a yeoman's uh, work of an organization of a thousand people and they're doing it with five or six. So I think that that's just something that is um, indicative of the passion to protect and to create thriving communities that you give all that you have even if you don't have much to give other than your time and your effort. What kind of responses do you want to see people take next time there's a pandemic? Well, I think that the first thing is that we need to accept that there will be another one. So we need to prepare now. And it's not if, it's just when. It's uh, really looking at the fact that we have an infrastructure in place that really doesn't shore up support or engage in protecting all of its citizens. I mean, what we're seeing in the streets right now in the U.S. around George Floyd is, is sort of this outpouring of, yes, it's this man was murdered and all these other things have occurred, but it's also this understanding that no matter what we do in this country as African-Americans, we're always behind. And so I think it's really the, now is the time that we do the work to level the playing field so that communities and individuals in those communities can see their wages increase and can see that they are actually being able to build towards a sustainable future for themselves and their families. And do you have hope? Like the recent protests against police violence have actually resulted in what we think are going to be policy changes. So do you think it's possible that like this moment has proven that large numbers of people can come together and make a difference in a way that maybe we didn't believe before the pandemic? I'm optimistic and I'm hopeful, but it's tempered, right? I'm, I'm, it's tempered because there are other folks who have other issues and other desires and other needs that also have a platform. And so how do we come together and say what's in the best interest of all of us, even if it doesn't make you comfortable or it's not exactly what you want? Can you see further ahead than just in this moment? There's an urgency and we all feel it. So how do you translate the urgency, the policy that might come out, and then the actual outcome that has the benefit and the impact that we request? Like we're at the point, I'm at the point, we're all at the point that Incremental change is no longer enough. We've been waiting for generations, and it's obvious that no one is going to do it unless we decide enough. It needs to be transformative, and it needs to really push us forward to a conversation that says, this is a country for everyone, and the way to do that is to galvanize the community, grassroots folks, and everyone together and figure out how do we address this? How do we create the necessary steps so that we can answer the call of making our future more sustainable and our communities more resilient in a way that right now the government isn't really thinking about, even though they said they are going to consider it, that we actually need to be more proactive and more engaged in addressing this need. You can learn more about the National Black Environmental Justice Network, donate to support their work, and apply to be a member at www.nbejn.com. And that's our show. Social Distance Assistance is produced and engineered by June Hardcastle Robinson Jones, Kelly Jones, and Molly Bourne. It was created and edited by Nate Toby. Gavin Wright makes it all happen. Digital assistance from Angela Messino and the VPM News team. Steve Humble is VPM's chief content officer. Special thanks to Amanda Nicholson from the Wildlife Center of Virginia. 
Music for this week's episode was by Blue Dot Sessions. If you like what you heard, help us out. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts and leave us a rating or a review. And we have some news. Social Distance Assistance will be wrapping up soon so that we can focus on non-COVID-related podcast projects. The point of this show is to bring you stories of creative ways people are helping during the pandemic. But we also hope to inspire you to be a helper, too. Will you tell us how you've been a helper these last few months? Your story could be on one of our upcoming episodes. Record a voice memo and email it to helpers at vpm.org. Or call us and leave us a message at 804-404-2859. Members are a fundamental part of VPM. Member support is especially vital right now. Through member support, we are able to provide timely and fact-based information, educational resources for our kids, and informative and entertaining content to keep minds active and engaged. Be a part of what makes VPM possible. Visit vpm.org slash donate to become a member today. Hi, I'm Ahmed Badr. I'm the host of VPM's new podcast, Resettled. It highlights the stories of refugees as they resettle in Virginia and the milestone moments that shape their experience. In this six-part series, we break down what resettlement actually looks like, through humbling moments of surprise to the challenges of adjusting to a new home. And we explore tough questions, like how do we grow when we're starting over? Check out Resettled wherever you get your podcasts. VPM.